Hey guys, Tyler here. In many ways, Star Trek the Animated Series is an often forgotten part of the franchise. Having aired from 1973 to 1974, half a decade after the cancellation of the original series, TAS continues Kirk's five-year mission as captain of the Enterprise, with a few notable changes. Some new additions to the cast include alien crew members Mares and Eryx, and the animated series depicts a variety of alien life forms in Trek's Milky Way that could only be dreamt of in live action. I recently made a retrospective video on the original series in which I briefly discussed TAS and how I don't exactly think it's on the same quality level as the live action shows, and indeed its canon status has fluctuated over the years. Nevertheless, it made some significant lore contributions and continues to influence Trek to this day. In this video, I'd like to highlight various intelligent alien species introduced in the animated series, focusing on their biology and comparing them to our expectations about aliens in real life. Let's get started. Did you know that flavored air devices are quickly becoming the leading alternative to vaping and smoking? It's an entire new movement towards better habits, led by today's sponsor, Fume. Fume is an award-winning flavored air device that fills the void ditching a bad habit can leave. You'll still have something to reach for. Fume draws flavor to your mouth through a passive diffusion system, but doesn't use vapor, meaning you can use it anywhere. No nicotine, so it's not addictive. And no batteries, so you'll never have to charge it. The device looks awesome, is perfectly weighted, and incredibly fun to fidget with. If vapor were compared to sticky soda, Fume cores are closer to herbal teas. They've got lots of delicious flavors to to choose from like crisp mint and orange vanilla. Based on my channel name, you can probably tell which one piqued my interest the most. Fume is backed by doctors in the US and has served over 150,000 customers. You can be their next success story. For a limited time, use my code Orange River to get 10% off a journey pack. Head to tryfume.com. That's tryfum.com and use Orange River or scan the QR code on screen to save 10% off your order today. Now, Back to the video. Among the first alien species we're exposed to in the animated series is the Adosian species, race of the Enterprise navigator, Lieutenant Eryx, a six-limbed triped species native to the planet Eidos in the Alpha Quadrant. Edosians are known for their slender build, but also demonstrate incredible strength. They can even emit a guttural roar when angered. We don't know a lot about Eidos, but it's referenced in other Trek installments as being the home of various life forms like the Edosian Orchid, Edosian Slug, and Edosian Suckerfish. The name of the Edosian homeworld comes from a biography of Eryx published in a 1974 Lincoln Enterprises catalog. While not canon, some information from this biography has seemingly been accepted into canon. While TAS and Lower Decks suggest that the Edosians are likely Federation members, the biography states Edos and the Federation are merely in a loose alliance. The Edosians are described as a peaceful, long-lived polytheistic species with an egalitarian society and utilitarian architectural style. The biography also places Edos in the Triangulum constellation near the Galactic Barrier. We don't know exactly what kind of star Edos orbits, but other non canon reference materials claim it is the third planet of its system, suggesting Eidos' primary star may be like our own primary star, Sol. Interestingly, the Star Trek novel continuity claims Eryx is a member of the Triaxian race and makes a distinction between Triaxians and Edosians, but this, in my opinion, completely unnecessary distinction definitely doesn't exist in canon. While a tripedal species might seem unlikely, to be fair, the vast majority of animal life on Earth is six-limbed. We only have four limbs because the evolutionary line that led to humans emerged from lobe-finned fishes nearly 400 million years ago, which gave rise to a class called tetrapods. While a six-limbed alien species would need to expend more energy 
to power extra muscles compared to humanoids, their third arms and legs being front-facing, combined with their remarkable strength, could indicate a higher surface gravity on Eidos. Also, according to art designer Robert Klein, the legs of a gazelle were used as a starting point for designing Eryx's body plan, and he suggested that like an owl, Edosians can adjust their torso to rotate almost 360 degrees. Continuing the trend of non-humanoid aliens, the animated series introduces a number of bug-like beings throughout the galaxy. The first episode, Beyond the Farthest Star, shows on a view screen an insectoid commander whose species is never identified. This species lived more than 300 million years ago, and their technology was very advanced. They utilized an unknown alloy, lighter and harder than any metal, known to the Federation in the 23rd century. The construction techniques of their starships drew the alloy into filaments and then spun them like a spider's web. And their spacecraft designs incorporated hexagonal cell formations nearly identical to honeycombs of bees on Earth. They also used energy accumulating wands to collect energy from sound, motion, magnetism, light, and heat. One of their pod ships is encountered by the Enterprise in 2269 near Questar M17, a dead star on the fringe of the Milky Way. Large doors in the aired episode also point towards the idea that the species was rather gigantic. Typically, large creatures with exoskeletons would be prohibited by the square cube law although arthropods on Earth were capable of growing to much larger sizes in prehistoric times, in part due to higher oxygen concentrations. The atmospheric pressure and gravity of the pod ship are relatively Earth-like in the episode, so this species may have instead had an endoskeleton with chitin-like armor skin or a softer outer carapace to support their advanced size. One of the other memorable insectoid races from the animated series is the species of M3 Green, a lot Pick, who accompanies Kirk and Spock on a mission to retrieve an artifact called the Soul of Score in the Jihad. These aliens possess six limbs and two legs and a wide tail, and all the ones seen throughout Trek are green in color. M3 Green's species is identified in the novels as the Nasat, a name also used in the game Star Trek Timelines and on Star Trek.com. And the novels confirm there are also blue and red Nassat. M says his people are not known for taking risks, and various novels elaborate that while the Nassat are Federation members, they rarely leave their home world save for a few enterprising individuals. Also, this image in particular is kind of f***ing disturbing to look at, so I'm going to take it off screen right now. Not much is known about their home world, but they're said to share it with an intelligent plant-like species called the Satoak. The novel continuity describes the Nasat as being crustaceans, which would technically be more accurate than using the descriptor insectoid, since many crustaceans have more than six legs, with many crabs having eight in addition to their two clawed arms. The Jihad also introduces a number of other alien species, including the Score, an ornithoid race that possesses feathered wings that allow them to fly and hover. Once a great race of warriors with advanced technology and the ability to rapidly breed vast armies, since the mid-21st century, the Score have practiced pacifism, similarly to the Vulcans. Their homeworld orbits a binary M-type star in the Beta Quadrant, according to the admittedly now outdated Star Trek maps, which nonetheless Nonetheless, serves as one of the only published sources charting locations from the animated series. They bear a strong resemblance to the Aurelians, a member of which named Alik Am, a Federation historian, appears in the animated series episode Yesteryear. These aliens' homeworld, Aurelia, is, according to various non-canon reference sources, located in the Xi Herculis system, Xi Herculis being a G-type giant star 2.48 billion years in age. The large wingspans of Aurelians and Score indicate they both may have evolved on planets with higher gravity, their flight capability allowing them to overcome the more intense acceleration forces. Their avian nature is also a welcome flavor of Trek alien design, given that birds are along with primates, elephants, cetaceans, and octopuses, some of the most intelligent animals on Earth. Aurelians seemingly prefer living in spherical treehouses, and they lay eggs to reproduce. The Aurelians, featured in Lower Decks, 
are actually closer in design to the original score from the Jihad rather than Alik Alm's slimmer build, a deliberate choice made because, in the words of co-producer Brad Winters, the score look cooler. And I kind of have to agree with that. Winters has suggested that the Aurelians and score probably share a common ancestor, and that in the century between the Jihad and Lower Decks, the two races have probably interbred once again. Overall, 9 out of 10 alien design. Wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm not ranking these. One of the other specialists gathered to retrieve the soul of Score is Sword, a member of an unnamed reptilian species. This alien possesses dark green scaly skin and a large head crest, a tail, four-fingered clawed hands, and a digitigrade stature. I've talked numerous times about digitigrade and plantigrade statures, such as in my video about the Aquarians from Mass Effect, and this has led to some speculation that I'm actually a furry. I'm not, but you can't deny that Tally is best girl. It was totally worth it. Anyway, it's actually a misconception that digitigrade means backwards facing knees. In fact, this is an illusion as what looks like a backwards facing shin bone is actually the animal's foot. It's been speculated by fans and various Star Trek authors that Sword may be a member of the Nalish species, a race introduced in the TNG novel Reunion who were also members of the Federation. One of my favorite alien species from the animated series is the Vendorian species, tentacled non-humanoid creatures capable of shape-shifting. They originate from the Beta Quadrant planet Vendor Prime, the second planet in a binary star system consisting of an F-type primary and M-type companion. Vendorians are known for being duplicitous, and by the second half of the 23rd century, Vendor Prime is under quarantine. The treaty between the Federation and Romulan Empire even prohibits the use of Vendorian spies. Nevertheless, we occasionally see Vendorians out and about, as it were, impersonating other species such as in The Survivor and Lower Decks Envoys. Vendorians reproduce by laying brood pods in the throats of other beings and watching them hatch, making them a clear example of parasitic species like the xenomorphs from Alien. The ability of the Vendorians to rearrange their molecular structures into any shape with the same general size and mass is definitely another one of their trademark traits, and I think it's interesting to consider whether this is a biologically evolved trait or one that the Vendorians artificially genetically engineered into themselves. Indeed, the Vendorians do possess advanced medical technology. Additionally, we learn that the longer a Vendorian remains in another's form, the more its memories, emotions, and attitudes become ingrained and meshed with the Vendorian's own personality. They're also capable of rendering some humanoids unconscious by touch alone. Culturally, the Vendorians seem to have a class-based society that places considerable importance on the individual. Those who are considered non-producers are deemed as outcasts, such as a Vendorian impersonating human philanthropist Carter Winston in The Survivor. One of the more whimsical additions to Vendorian lore comes from the Lower Decks episode, Caves, in which we learn that Vendorians frequently subject other beings to morality tests. One of these morality tests pits Brad Boimler against notorious conspiracy theorist Lieutenant Steve Levy. Levy's correct assessment that the Vendorians will punish them by laying brood pods in their necks impresses the Vendorians, who note Levy's knowledge of their customs is mixed with hyperbole and fiction. We did not, as you put it, do the Klingon Civil War. <laughs> mm, agree to disagree. The Vendorian leader declares their morality gambit has worked after Boimler says that while Levy is still a crackpot with dangerous beliefs, he's learned to not yell at him. Another one of the most widely recognized alien species from the animated series are the Phylosians. A species of sentient plants, they are native to the Alpha Quadrant planet Phylos, which, according to various reference sources, orbits a K-type orange star. Very technologically advanced by the time of the Enterprise's encounter with them in The Infinite Vulcan, the Phylosians have naturally long lifespans further extended by their advanced medical science. Around the late 21st century, they sought to enforce peace in the galaxy and built a large fleet of ships. 
However, upon being visited by a Eugenics Wars era human scientist named Stavos Caniglius, the Phylosians fell victim to a strain of non-native Staphylococcus bacteria that nearly wiped them out. We see in the episode that Caniglius and subsequent generations of clones have stayed to help undo this damage. The Enterprise crew tells Caniglius and the Phylosians about the peacekeeping mission of the Federation, and Caniglius creates a clone of Spock to help him find a final cure for the Phylosians. By the 24th century, this plan seems to have worked, as at least one Phylosian serves in Starfleet aboard the USS Cerritos, as mentioned in dialogue in the Lower Decks episode, Cupid's Errant Arrow. The episode, The Ambergris Element, features the Aquans, natives of the planet Argo, a Class O planet orbiting a yellow dwarf star. Argo was once a land planet, but its surface became almost completely covered in water after a series of seismic disturbances. I should note that I'm not the biggest fan of this trope in sci-fi because that's not how geology works. Like, a, a giant earthquake in California isn't gonna plunge Los Angeles hundreds of feet into the ocean. The Earth didn't flood 4,000 years ago, there was no ark. Uh, we're kind of getting off track. The Aquans themselves were once air breathers, presumably mammalian, but began to genetically alter themselves to live underwater. These artificial mutations eventually became hereditary, and over generations, the water-breathing Aquans came to fear their remaining land-dwelling counterparts. The air-breathing Aquans were hunted and killed, and presumably went extinct at some point. Contemporary Aquans have flat noses, webbed hands, loose ankle fins, and long hair, and have retained a highly sophisticated architecture and medical technology. They are governed by a tribunal, and by the time of the Enterprise's visit, their society is deeply ideologically divided along generational lines. Due to the Enterprise's intervention, a faction of younger Aquans plans to return to the surface and make peace with those who remained in Aqua City. The episode The Eye of the Beholder features the Lactrans, a civilization of large, slug-like creatures from the planet Lactra 7. Orbiting a G-type giant star according to maps, the episode states Lactra 7 has normal atmospheric pressure and gravity. The Lactrans have at least one major city that notoriously contains a vast alien zoo hundreds of kilometers large. The zoo houses a variety of life forms from other planets with habitats manufactured to suit their needs. The Lactrans themselves have a trunk-like proboscis on the front of their face that ends in three finger-like appendages, used as their main mode of manipulating objects. Their two eyes are also slightly raised from their head. Indeed, this specific design in many ways reminds me of prehistoric animals from the Cambrian period on Earth like Anomalocaris and Opabinia which had frontal appendages, stalky eyes, and in the case of the latter, a soft body that I could imagine evolving into a form like the Lactrans given enough time. The Lactrans have a history spanning tens of thousands of centuries, and they are so highly evolved that even Vulcans cannot comprehend their complex telepathic communication. A six-year-old Lactran is already said to possess an IQ in the thousands, and the Lactrans' telepathic powers can be used to probe the minds of other beings. While the Enterprise's visit to Lactra 7 seemingly uncovers very little else in the way of useful information, the Lactrans have made it clear that Starfleet is welcome to revisit their planet in a few thousand years. Or when they're smart enough to get Rick and Morty, whichever comes first. I am... I am firing my script editor. Another one of the more creative aliens from the animated series, in my opinion, are the Pandronians, introduced in the episode BIM. Nominally humanoid, the Pandronians are in fact colony creatures, cooperative beings made up of distinct organisms. As a consequence, individuality has little unique meaning for Pandronians. Just as with the jellyfish-like Hanar, later created for Mass Effect, Pandronians refer to individual colonies as this one, 
rather than the more expected eye used by most other humanoid species. The organisms are largely autonomous and mobile on their own via a method of bipedal locomotion as well as a form of levitation that has not yet been fully explained. Over time, the separate organisms that constitute a Pandronian may disassemble and reassemble with other creatures to create a new colony, effectively terminating the existence of the prior unique Pandronian. They have green skin with tufts of red hair and large eyes, and are typically of comparable height to humans and Vulcans. While many of these design choices might seem absurd, on the contrary, Colony creatures are real. Also called modular organisms, some of the most well-known colony creatures are siphonophores, assembled from different types of plankton, and the Portuguese man-o-war, assembled from predatory animals called hydrozoa. Subunits of these organisms can be unicellular or multicellular, and in fact, they may have even been the first step towards multicellular organisms overall. They can also reproduce sexually or asexually, which is in line with the depiction of both male and female Pandronians in TAS and Lower Decks. In fact, dialogue in BIM suggests that Pandronians lay eggs rather than give live birth. As for the levitation, it's possible they make use of hydrogen-filled sacs to counteract the downward pull of gravity in their environment. The fourth and fifth episodes of the animated series' second season introduce an alien species that is rather one-note, the Dramians, as well as one that is more interesting, the serpent-like Kukulkan. The Dramians, also referred to as the Dramans, are tall humanoids from the planet Dramia II, seen in the episode Albatross. They have gold-colored skin and long, flexible, tendril-like fingers, as well as bulbous, dark eyes. While hailing from a remote star system, the Dramans maintain relations with the Federation. Kukulkan's species, as seen in How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth, is a near-extinct race that possessed highly advanced technology. Bearing feathered wings and tails, as well as a feathered mane, the lifespan of individuals of the species lasted thousands of years. Kukul Khan himself is the sole survivor of his race, and we learn he was instrumental in several technological and architectural advances of various societies on Earth such as the Egyptians, Mayans, Aztecs, and ancient Chinese. He taught early humans new techniques in agriculture and art, hoping they would combine this knowledge and build a great city and live in peace, though this never came to fruition. Had it been completed, the city would have become an energy amplification system that sent a signal to summon Kukul Khan. Indeed, he manifested in history as legends of a winged serpent creature from the sky that brought knowledge, and he was associated with both the Chinese dragon as well as the lore of Quetzalcoatl in Aztec mythology. In fact, Kukul Khan is his Mayan name. While I think it's fair to criticize How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth for playing into the ancient aliens trope, I actually kind of like this episode, and Kukul Khan's design is undeniably cool. On the other hand, the animated series, like other treks, also depicts alien species who are virtually identical to humans, save for some internal biological factors. One such race is Thela's species from the Tarian system, as seen in the Lorelei signal. Female members of this species adapted to the conditions of a planet they colonized in their system by developing a glandular secretion, which endowed them with tremendous psychokinetic ability. Their abilities allow them to manipulate the brains of the males of their species, weakening them and eventually killing them off. The women became trapped on the planet, incapable of aging, dying, or bearing children. They also found that to survive, they had to periodically revitalize their bodies. Isn't that kind of a contradiction? As early as the year 2119, these aliens began luring starships from nearby sectors to capture and enslave male crew members. After the Enterprise crew's intervention, the women are eventually relocated to another star system where they can live out natural lifespans. And speaking of powerful beings, there's also the Megans from the Magics of Megas II, who live in an alternate dimension governed by magic. They are externally indistinguishable from humans, but do 
due to their magical abilities, they can take on many forms like those of spirits. Some Magans, who traveled to Earth by the 17th century and settled in Salem, Massachusetts, were burned at the stake as witches. Gee, I wonder why so many people think the animated series shouldn't be canon. Now, you might be wondering, how come I haven't discussed the Cations or Kazinti? Well, as a matter of fact, I have a whole video dedicated just to them that you can go check out after this video. Link in the description. As I mentioned earlier, we of course see the Cations regularly throughout TAS in the form of Mares, and the episode that brings the Kazinti into Star Trek canon, the Slaver Weapon, also offers a possible depiction of the Slavers who ruled a galaxy-spanning empire a billion years ago. These aliens went extinct during an apocalyptic conflict called the Slaver War that supposedly caused all life in the Milky Way to re-evolve. I also want to address a frequent comment that I got on my Cations video, which is that I didn't discuss the Vidala, the final alien species introduced in the Jihad. Another feline-like humanoid species, the Vidala, are described as one of the oldest surviving races known to the Federation but to put it bluntly, that's honestly about it. They do possess some pretty advanced holographic and long-distance transporter technology. They also have a proven ability to manipulate time, claiming that the participants in the retrieval of the Soul of Score would soon forget about the mission, indicating their powers extend beyond this dimension. But biologically, the Vidala are just cats. Maybe lemurs? I don't know what you guys want me to say. Anyway, moral of the story, go watch Cations if you haven't already. There's also the matter energy cloud that consumes celestial bodies in one of our planets is missing, which contains elements unknown to Federation periodic tables. It also seems to have equivalents to a brain and digestive system. For more info about creatures like that, check out my video as well about non-corporeal beings in Star Trek. Link in the description too. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my donors who allow me to bring on outside talent like editors to make more high quality content for you to enjoy. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. And big thanks once again to Fume for sponsoring today's video. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Thank you.